Okay, so um, we have a 49 year old man with past medical history significant of non Hodgkin lymphoma who presents with a reported skin rash that started three days prior to admission. RG, go ahead, my friend. All right, you got it. Um, I, um, I think <clears throat> you know that this is already an unusual situation because most patients with rashes don't get admitted. And um, that tells you a lot about the severity of this rash. But let's pretend like we didn't know, um, we didn't know anything about the outcome of this um, evaluation. Um, the key questions with a patient with rash are to establish like anything, the, the dimensions of it. And with a rash, you wanna know the horizontal dimension and the vertical dimension. The horizontal dimension you can see with your very eyes and that means how extensive is the rash? Does it go from head to toe or is it a small patch over the elbow? That's the horizontal dimension. The vertical dimension is how deep it is. Um, the depth of the rash is much harder for a non-expert to perceive, but um, can be studied more and more closely. So the more necrosis you see, the deeper it is, the more nodular the rash is, the deeper it is. Um, the more painful it, the rash is, the deeper it is. And the more itchy a rash is, the more superficial it is. So while you will learn with more and more time and practice how to assess depth, the key um, is to have a sense of how extensive is it horizontally and vertically. That happens in parallel with another key question as a non-expert, which is to say, is there any evidence of internal organ involvement? as you try to tabulate what the center of gravity of the disease is. And those are the key questions when you're trying to analyze a rash. What is the, what is the horizontal dimension? What is the vertical dimension? And is there any um, evidence of visceral organ involvement along with the other key parameters of the problem representation, which is, who is this patient? And here there's the history of lymphoma, which I'll pass on to Prof. Best to reflect on. And then of course, knowing the time course, which we know here is acute. So, depth, width, and visceral involvement. Uh, but the background here is intriguing and I'll pass the mic to rest to reflect on. I, I love that approach. Uh, very, um, a, a very solid approach for quite a um, broad problem. I think one comment I'll make when, when the chief concern is rash, it makes sense to look at the rash before you actually obtain a history. Because the physical appearance of the rash, the involvement of mucosal surfaces um, will dictate what questions you ask. Um, and of course, uh, when you get this complaint and if you're an internal medicine you know, student, resident, you should go down, look at the rash and let that guide your questioning of the patient. I think what you can do with the lymphoma here, so of course we all have a general approach to lymphoma and maybe Ravi, Ravi has created such a terrific like um, library of approaches and lymphoma is one of them. Ravi, if you don't mind sharing that with the audience, the way you break down lymphoma. Um, but in any case, whenever you have a, a background history, the question becomes, is the current presentation related to the problem here being non-Hodgkin lymphoma? So is there a relapse? And are there cutaneous manifestations of the non-Hodgkin lymphoma? You worry about the medication side effects. So is it a primary problem with the non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Is it related to the medications the patient is receiving or has received for the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? And the third thing is that many times, and Nasser will let us know exactly how this patient was treated, when this patient was treated, but when you have a cancer autoimmune disease, you know that the patient was probably immunosuppressed, which opens up you know, to the possibility of infection, both typical and atypical infections. So I think a key branch point here is gonna be looking at the skin, and then two, determining if this patient has markers of inflammation or not. Because if it's inflammation in rash, it's a totally different you know, approach that we take. And the final thing I'll tell you is like, when you're dealing with a rash, if there's mucosal involvement, 
if it's painful, um, if there's stuff that's like sloughing off, blisters, those are red flags for the rash. Stuff like pruritus is actually a reassuring sign. So um, I don't know, Ravi, did you have any other thoughts on lymphoma and rash before we, we go further? All right, Mike, to you, Nasser. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on with our case. So uh, one week ago, uh, the patient had tooth pain with dental caries, and he went to his PCP who prescribed him amoxicillin. And the day prior to admission, he went to get his uh, port flushed, which is uh, done every six weeks. And after returning, he noticed that his rash has gotten worse and uh, it started to spread. It first appeared on his arms and then it started to spread in his lower abdomen as well as back. And his rash is painless and non-itching. The rash was associated with extreme lethargy, fatigue, and feeling of warmth. He had some chills, but he never measured his temperature at home. He also reports some sore throat that occurred during that time as well. He denies any recent travel or any sick contact, and he is vaccinated with double shots for COVID. Wow, this is another great um, stop point. And, and maybe I can talk a little bit about the rash and let Robbie sort of incorporate the other um, symptoms and findings of this patient. Um, I'll just focus on rash and antibiotic uh, treatment. So this again becomes important um, to outline the sequence of events. So it seems like he had some rash, if I'm not mistaken, got amoxicillin and the rash worsened um, and also got something flushed in the port. This is really important. Now, all of this may be unrelated to the worsening of the rash, but an immediate exercise one must go through is whether those medications led to the progression of the rash. So to give you an example, if someone has a sore throat, pharyngitis, for example, most of the time it's bacterial in nature. But what if it's related to mono and they get a beta-lactam antibiotic and then they break out into a macular, macular and papular rash? So that's one possibility. It's, not tr it's true that patients at this age are less likely to um, present with mono. Usually most of us get exposed to it during our youth. Um, another possibility is could this be a, a drug eruption so if you get an antibiotic and then have a rash, um, what kind of drug eruptions can you have? Well, if it's your first time exposed to the antibiotic and you have a rash immediately after, like within 24 hours, you can think about acute generalized exanthomatous pustulosis, also known as AGEP. That can happen within a, a day of exposure to antibiotics. Um, but again, the physical exam will be crucial. Stuff like drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome takes at least two weeks from exposure to actually uh, manifest in a patient. And Nasser didn't tell us there was any mucosal involvement to think about the Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis. And we also don't know what was flushed. So I guess before I pass the mic to Robbie, I'm wondering if that initial rash um, is unrelated to what he's presenting with now being exposure in rash or was exposure unrelated and this is just progression of that initial rash. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about the rash, but I think the other parts of the history may allow us to make a little more progress in terms of concern. I couldn't agree more with you. I love that, that notion that everything about what happened to this person in the rash has to be speculation. And I think that the accompanying features are less speculative, right? Like he has uh, the sense of chills, pharyngitis, um, and fatigue. 
And their relationship to the current syndrome is less debatable than whether or not amoxicillin or the flushing is relatable. Um, it's hard not to say that they'll be part of the answer, but the question is how much weight do they carry? You know, when somebody has such an extensive rash, is it expected for them to be fatigued no matter what? When somebody has um, and such an extensive rash, is it uh, expected for them to go back into their mind and say, oh, you know, maybe my throat was hurting, maybe, my, uh, maybe they're more vigilant than they would otherwise be. And I, I would extend the same degree of caution that Reza is extending to uh, attaching the amoxicillin and the flushing to the syndrome to speculating on whether these other features are actually dominant or not. Now, unlike the amoxicillin and the flushing, you can actually, by watching the patient and again, going to the exam, apply a level of credibility and concern to those things. If he's literally shaking in front of you, or if you see erythema and exudates in the pharynx, that'll change the weight that you can apply to those findings. Um, so for me, I think that everything else, the pharyngitis, the chills, could go in the third arm that we talked about initially. The first two arms were, what is the, what is the horizontal dimension of this rash? What is the vertical dimension of this rash? And is there any visceral involvement? And when you say chills, pharyngitis, and systemic symptoms, that begets the notion that there probably is visceral involvement. But in real life, you would have to temper that enthusiasm for visceral involvement by the probability that merely a patient who is ill is more vigilant to subtle symptoms that may be distractors. Um, rather than true diagnostic signal. And I bet if you asked me if a one week from now, for whatever reason, if I end up in the hospital, you ask me, hey, like, have you been, had you been feeling sick or stressed recently? I'd be like, yeah, probably. But if you asked me any one of those days, um, I would probably say yes to that. Um, especially stress when Nasser's running a case. So I'll hand the mic up to him to give us more information. Thank you, Raza and Robbie. Um, so, you know, moving on about talking about his uh, past medical history. Um, so he has this non-Hodgkin lymphoma that uh, it was uh, diagnosed around uh, five years ago, and he underwent chemotherapy up until two years uh, uh, prior to his admission. Um, he uh, continued to have this port um, portal catheter in place though he was still in remission and he was just following up with oncology for that. Um, and he also has a history of hypertension, diabetes, uh, CKD stage three, as well as hyperlipidemia. Social history, besides what's mentioned, he lives with his mother and brother and he denies any alcohol, smoking or illicit drug use. Family uh, history, uh, there was none that is contributory. Surgical history, there was none either. Medication wise, he's on amlodipine, carvedilol, hydrochlorothiazide, and losartan for hypertension. He's on metformin and glipizide for diabetes. And of course, the amoxicillin antibiotics, that is five, um, uh, 500 milligram TID. Allergy wise, there's no known drug allergies. And moving on to his uh, vitals. So his temperature was 39.4. Heart rate was 115. R respiratory rate was 18. Blood pressure was 90 over 48. And his saturation were 97% on room air. Physical exam, uh, he had some mild diaphoresis. There was no uh, conjunctival injection or any abnormalities in the eyes. He had dry oral mucosa, no pharyngeal edema or exudates, and no signs of mucositis. He also did not have any uh, enlarged lymph node that I could appreciate on my exam. Cardiovascular wise, he was tachycardic, but regular rhythm. His extremities were well perfused and warm, and he had plus one bilateral upper extremity non-pitting edema. His respiratory and GI examinations were unremarkable. And his skin shows warm confluent macules that spread from the upper extremities 
to the lower abdomen as well as the lower back. He also has a, a right subclavian porticat that appears clean, dry, and intact. There was no tenderness and no jaundice. Neurologically, no gross uh, focal deficits. Um, and uh, Ravi, I don't know if you have a picture of the rash. Uh, maybe we can share it um, with the audience. Can you share your screen? Yeah, give me one second. We'll just put it up shortly. So this is a picture of the rash on his upper extremities. I'm just most impressed by the fact that you didn't say this is an extensive maculopapular rash, which is probably what I would have said. The detailed descriptions are very, very impressive. Um, yeah, no shame in that, by the way. I think it's totally okay. Um, Nasser, I just, I, I, um, for those of you who are um, tuning in now and listening on YouTube later, I think um, it's actually very intimidating. I'm learning to present a case on this platform. I think language barriers may be an issue. Um, how shiny and beautiful Reza's head is, is maybe a barrier too. Um, but I, I would say that fear not. Um, what Nasser is doing is what all master presenters do, which is he's presenting slowly, deliberately, and making sure our beautiful, um, uh, um, our amazing sets of um, scribes and teaching point people are able to keep up. And um, Nasser, I just want to commend you for that. It's clear that you're paying, paying very close attention um, to the scribe and um, making for an effortless uh, case presentation. I'll pass the mic to Reza to talk about the exam. And I think that's the most alarming part. Um, uh, but uh, the, the background data here really doesn't, didn't sway me much. And, you know, the patient has a history of very, some very common conditions like hypertension and chronic kidney disease and some very common medications associated with those conditions. Um, and, um, and it's, it's not too surprising that in the absence of clarity in the foreground, um, the background is a little bit hazy, but it's hard not to ignore the possibility of lymphoma in the background. And Reza already taught us as to why that might be re um, relevant. And so that's looming in the background, but I probably wouldn't use it to shape the foreground analysis, which I'll pass to Reza um, until we have more clarity on the foreground. So Mike T. Prof. Rez. Awesome, Robbie. I think that, um... And maybe as we talk about the exam, Nasser, do you mind showing the picture of the rash again? And then Robbie, I would love for you to comment here too, because I think it's like a, a pivot point in this case. Um, so, so alarming. And there's more than one approach to how to think about this. So can't wait to hear your thoughts. And um, Nasser, one question for you, my friend, does this rash blanch or not? It's non-blanching. Non-blanching, okay. That's very helpful. So everyone, you can almost see how angry and red it, the rash appears. And the blanching versus non-blanching is a critical first step because if a, ranch, if a rash blanches, I said, I almost said ranch, Robbie, because I'm thinking about what I'm gonna have for lunch today. I don't know why I'm thinking about lunch when I'm looking at a rash. That's something wrong there. But if I'm it, telling you, I, I, I bring my breakfast here and you bring your lunch thoughts. That's, that's <laughs> um, so if it blanches, it tells you there's vasodilation. Okay, there's vasodilation. But if a rash doesn't blanch, it tells you that there's extravasation of red blood cells. This is like almost like petechiae, purpura, ecchymosis. So a non-blanching rash, and the way to tell if a rash blanches or not, you can take like a clear Ziploc bag or something in the patient's room where they like store stuff and just put it over the rash and see if it blanches or not. And we know that there's no mucosal involvement here. So now what is the frame of this problem? The frame of this problem is actually fever in diffuse non-blanching erythematous rash. That, that's the crux of this case. And with the background that Robbie mentioned of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the exposure to antibiotics. If this redness 
involves most of the body, then you can even be more specific with your frame and say erythroderma. Erythroderma is just a description that prompts a differential diagnosis from cutaneous T-cell lymphoma to psoriasis to drug-related uh, rashes. So I think where I'm most comfortable is actually fever and rash because we have a schema on our website and I'm gonna um, put this schema in the chat as I talk about it. But basically, I think step one is to always be open to infectious probability. But here, I just am having trouble thinking of a lot of like, vi it doesn't appear like a viral exanthem. You would wanna make sure of the travel history. Where is this patient located? What kind of potential um, infections are they exposed to via mosquitoes and, and other types of um, bugs? And you always have to consider the life-threatening causes of rash, which includes necrotizing fasciitis, endocarditis, rocky mounted spotted fever, and toxic shock syndrome from strep or staph. But, you know, although, you know, we'll evaluate for infection, like my gestalt is that this rash <clears throat> is either related to a drug or related to the background of his cancer. The thing with his cancer, we would want to know when he first presented, did he have lymphadenopathy? I'd want to know what is his LDH? The other thing I would really be interested in is what are his liver chemistry panel, kidney function, eosinophilia, just trying to get a sense if there's internal organ pathology or not. So um, Robbie, I want to hear from you here as well, but like I'm just framing this fever rash. Is this erythroderma? Is it cancer or drug related? But most concerned for infection, but less convinced of infection. No, Prof. I, I, I think that's absolutely superb. Uh, that schema is amazing. I think it was one of the first, one of the like OG uh, 10 schemas uh, that we put together. It's always so nice to review it. And I think it's really nice to review it because honestly, this is not something that any of us are comfortable with, with confidence. You know, I think a dermatologist, even a dermatologist would probably be saying, yo, like I need to lean on my internal medicine colleagues for the fever and the systemic dimension. So I don't think there's any specific person or specific specialty that is tailored to mastering this space because it involves the intersection of um, two very different fields, which is the master of the skin versus the master of the body. Um, and I think the practical perspective that I live within is, um, is what would I be thinking of as a no miss cause if this patient came into the emergency room. And it's helpful to practice that because if in real life, all that I would know in moment one, I probably wouldn't know about the lymphoma. I wouldn't know about the, the, I would probably be like, whoa, this person came in with a rash. They have the rash almost everywhere and their temperature is 39. What, what do I need to make sure I don't miss right away? And I think that's where the priority for now is on infection. And I think that if you don't know anything else, you have to think, the, the things that are immediately life-threatening to the patient or to the staff members. And so the one life-threatening thing to the staff members is measles, which is, has incredibly low probability, but I guarantee you that probability is going up higher and higher and higher in the world um, for a variety of political issues, namely um, the anti-vaxxer movement. Um, and so that's something that would cross my mind, but I would probably put that to bed with, um, with looking at the chart history. And then the other thing that I think looks like this that I cannot miss is toxic shock syndrome. And so I think the key question is, do you put, do you start this patient on broad spectrum um, antibiotics for toxic shock while you wait for that to happen? And honestly, I'm inclined to say yes. It's probably, as you alluded to, non-infectious, but in real life, the diffuse nature of this rash, the fact that it is, it is beefy red and not vasculitic as you would expect in endocarditis or rocky mounted spotted fever um, is making me really worried um, initially about hypotheses that will probably be tossed. It's probably not measles and it's probably not toxic shock. More commonly in my uh, uh, practice situation, the most probabilistic reason for this rash, if it's an infection, is scabies. And it's specifically Norwegian scabies, so scabies in immunocompromised patients like him, but that is not at play here because of the fever. Scabies causes devastation to the skin, but doesn't cause any systemic reaction. So when I see this rash, I think, what do I need to do to protect the staff 
scabies and measles? What do I need to do to protect the patient? Toxic shock. And honestly, the rest will probably have to lean on our practice in internal medicine with the data that will come next and ask our friends from dermatology to marry their in their expertise and hopefully we'll get um, get to the answer. So those are my those are my reflex. I, I absolutely love that. I am on board 100 percent with antimicrobial therapy, keeping in mind toxic. Brilliant. All right, Nasir, back to you, my friend. Thank you. Great dissection for the case. And it, it this case also twisted our brain so much when, uh, when we had him. Um, so moving on to the uh, lab findings that we had on admission, um, sodium was 132, potassium was 4.8, chloride was 96, mag was 1.0, bicarb was 24, Creatinine was 1.8. His baseline is around 1.6. Glucose was 320. Albumin was 3.2. Alkfos was 118. AST was 29. ALT was 27. LDH was 408. Total bilirubin was 2.6. His uh, CBC shows a white count of 7.2, hemoglobin of 9.7, hematocrit of 28, platelet of 134, lactate of 3.4, uh, PT was 17.9, INR was 1.5, and Procal was 6.13. And uh, there was no, on the uh, differential on that CBC, there was no uh, elevated uh, uh, eosinophils. Um, urine analysis shows no hematuria, no proteinuria, or, and no uh, leukocytes in the urine as well. Next, we have diagnostic images. We got a chest X-ray on admission that was uh, unremarkable. CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis without IV contrast shows extensive adenopathy in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. There was an increased lymph nodes uh, in size in the pelvic, inguinal, mesenteric, axillary, retroperitoneal, and mediastinal regions. Uh, there was a splenomegaly and a mild right-sided hydronephrosis. Because of the dental caries that he had, we did a CT of the facial bones without uh, IV contrast and that was normal. These are the admissions labs that I have. Uh, I have more labs, but that came later in the course. Let's hear some magic, yo. You were kind enough to pass me the mic as a bonus. I think you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Robbie, I can leave the lymphadenopathy for you to dissect and I'll hit up the labs. All right. So Nasser, you have me on the edge of my seat. Um, if I was the forward coming for the goal, you would be taking the ball off my feet like that. Uh, so I think the, the CBC is really important because there is concern, could this be drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, which really has a systemic type of phenotype and it has facial edema, you can get liver chemistry test abnormality, you can get a diffuse rash. However, we said that the time course is just not consistent with that. Like one day or a couple of days after antibiotics, usually it requires two weeks. The other thing is the rash is not consistent with acute generalized exanthomatous pustulosis. Right now, I'm just running the hypotheses of this antibiotic exposure. So, so far I'm getting no hits. The only hit that you might get with antibiotic exposure is if this patient for some reason had reactivation of mono EBV, um, started feeling a little sick, then got the antibiotic, and now is presenting with this rash. So it's like you have two processes occurring, meaning the rash is representing one thing, but everything else is from something else. But then the question is, why would this patient reactivate if they haven't had exposure to uh, immunosuppression for some time? That's one, one possibility, and there may be a knowledge gap for me. The other thing that's really important is the platelet count here, folks. The platelet count is crucial because whenever you have rash and fever, you have to consider DIC. We look at this patient's rash, it's not considered with the particular rash of DIC, but you always have to um, entertain that hypothesis. So that just gives me a little more reassurance. 
the LDH being elevated maybe correlates with those enlarged lymph nodes, which I'll leave for Robbie. Of all this data that um, is presented, you look at the creatinine and the procal. The creatinine, you're asking the question, is this kidney injury just a bystander of the inflammatory process? Or is it a signature of the systemic disease? In general, if you were betting and you were in Vegas, you would say this is a bystander um, because oftentimes it is. It's rarely where the center of gravity of a case is. However, you have to be cautious here because once you start invoking systemic processes, you have to entertain the possibility of you know, a glomerular uh, pathology. So I'm gonna be very interested to see what happens to this patient's creatinine after they receive intravenous fluids. And also would be interested to know if there is any proteinuria or anything that clues us in to um, a glomerular nephritis. If I wanted to link GN to rash, you can do that through immune complex mediated processes like cryo, lupus, endocarditis, um, and non-immune complex mediated like IgA, um, or non complementemic mediated processes like IgA vasculitis. The procal, folks, this is a very high procalcitonin. It's six, and um, I'm assuming that the upper limits of normal, at least in our lab, is like 0.5, so I'm assuming this is a very high level. Procalcitonin is released by the follicular cells of the um, parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, and oftentimes, its elevation is an indicator of bacterial infection. So at time point zero, if you have a very high procal, you have to consider bacteria. It can't be the all, it can't be all based on the procal. You have to look at the clinical picture. But if you say hypotension, fever, elevation in the procal, I'm back with Robbie. You have to be worried about strep pneumo and staph associated toxic shock syndrome. So I'll be interested in how this procalcitonin trends, but that's very high and we're worried about infection. So all of a sudden bacterial processes gain more credence. Uh, Mike, to you, Robbie, to pick up anything I missed and to comment on that lymphadenopathy. Oh, when somebody ends with the word credence in their discussion, how can you follow it? It's can I be honest with you? When I yeah. said the word, I'm like, am I using this word? I don't use it often. <laughs> and I was about to like do a quick Google search. And yeah, I was like, well, I'm an, I, I too am a, uh, like an international medical graduate in some sense of the yes. way. And so, uh, so ESL, you're... baby, all the way. <laughs> all the way. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so the key question for the imaging is, um, what are the chances that the imaging that this patient that that this patient uh, that that was obtained? What are the chances that this imaging? I can't talk either right now. What are the chances that this imaging was present a week or two ago, before the clinical syndrome? I have a very hard time believing that extensive lymphadenopathy in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, along with splenomegaly, began three days ago. Almost impossible. So I think the key question is, does the imaging actually afford a clue to the underlying diagnosis or does it provide credence <clears throat> to another <laughs> diagnosis? <laughs> I, um, I gotta Google it too. Um, to a, a parallel diagnosis. And that's actually very, very important to think about. Um, but if you're approaching lymphadenopathy, um, this is not just lymphadenopathy, this is systemic or diffuse lymphadenopathy, which is often either an infection or malignancy. There are very few non-infectious, non-malignant causes of diffuse lymphadenopathy, so autoimmunity here is much less likely. And when there is no solid focus of a malignancy, where um, it's the, within the malignancy category, if you don't see a dominant solid mass somewhere like lung cancer and lymphadenopathy, it's more likely to be liquid malignancy, especially if the patient has a history of it. So if you're looking at this, it's hard not to worry about, um, about lymphoma. But I think this case has some threads that, uh, uh, that weaken that hypothesis. And the first is the acuity of the current clinical syndrome, which we talked about already. But also, but also the amoxicillin exposure, the mild pharyngitis, um, and the lack of devastation on the signature of the labs. When you say somebody has a heart rate of 115, 
a blood pressure of 90 over 40 and a, and a fever almost 40. I honestly expected his lactate to be eight, his platelets to be 50, his creatinine to be five, and his liver enzymes to be through the roof. So there seems to be a very interesting disconnect between how sick he is on the surface with his temperature and his skin and how sick he is, no doubt, but proportionally much less viscerally he is. And I think um, to me, that would prompt me to do something a little bit unusual. I would still be on the bacterial train because of the procalcitonin, as Reza alluded to. I think you cannot argue against a high degree of concern for cancer in a patient with this, with this setup and history of cancer, worsening disease, but I think you have to test this patient for mononucleosis infections, which you might not otherwise do. Um, your insight into that might be looking at the diff on the CBC to see if there's lymphocytosis, which is a very powerful clue um, to the presence of um, EBV or CMV. Um, if you're playing a guessing game, guessing game between EBV or CMV, you should always bet EBV because it's much more common. But CMV starts to give it a little bit of a run for its money when there is less prominent pharyngitis, here, and um, when there is more systemic features also here, um, and when there's a rash also here. So um, I think I would test this patient for the fancy tests for EBV and CMV, not just the monospot, but the direct um, uh, antibodies for EBV and CMV IgM in, in addition to PCR. But we would be doing that in parallel, hoping for this patient that those tests are positive, but realistically knowing that out of 100 patients, only a fraction of patients with this exact painting will have EBV and CMV, and a lot of other ones will have things that are much more worrisome, like toxic shock or like um, either uh, a transformation of an indolent lymphoma um, or um, a progression of an indolent lymphoma into something more serious. All right, Nasser, back to you. Thank you. Um, we had similar thought process. So right off the bat, we started the patient with uh, antibiotics and gave him some fluids, subjectively started to feel better. Uh, his lactate started to improve. We had uh, oncology on board uh, giving the extensive uh, lymph lymphadenopathy on his CT. They had some suspicion that the lymphoma uh, could have had a rel relapsed, but they uh, could not, you know, make sense of the acuity of the illness, just like what you guys mentioned. Um, they suggested that they would want to do a biopsy once the patient clinically improves. And um, eventually the patient started to become uh, afebrile. He clinically improved. His we did cultures on him. We did the RVAP, influenza, COVID, they were all negative. We did uh, blood cultures that was negative. Uh, beta strip culture was negative. Um, we did complement levels, ANA, HIV, hepatitis panel, monospots. They were all uh, uh, negative. And, and uh, you know, we had to work him up as well for uh, other uh, viral uh, panels, such as what you had mentioned, CMV. The CMV, uh, IgG, and IgM uh, antibody panels were uh, negative. Um, in terms of EBV, uh, we did uh, anti-VCA IgM, which was negative, and we did a positive anti-VCA IgG, which was positive, and dermatology was consulted, and they had a they were had a they had a high suspicion that this is an EBV uh, reactivation syndrome, and they wanted to send out um, EBV uh, viral load which came back to be elevated at 570,000 copies per milliliters. So, you know, our uh, final thoughts is that this is a reactivation of EBV um, in, in the setting of um, amoxicillin um, exposure, uh, despite the IgM being negative, uh, but uh, given the patient's history for lymphoma, the, the viral uh, panel, uh, the PCR was significantly elevated, which gives out the diagnosis. Wow, Nasser, I don't, I am, um, I'm humbled by this. I actually don't, I don't know, um, like nuanced interpretation of EBV PCR, I always found very tricky and I, um, I'm stuck with that. I think at the end of the day, if your patient improves with supportive therapy um, and, um, uh, and does well, it's a diagnosis that you can be more and more comfortable about. 
Um, I think diagnosing EBV is one of the hardest things because the interpretation of the diagnostic test is so tricky. It can mean that you have primary EBV, it can mean that you have reactivation EBV, and it can mean that um, you have malignancy associated reactivation, which is uh, another kind of morbid thought. Um, but I'm so glad that uh, you had the tantalizing clue of amoxicillin, which um, Prof Rez picked up on in moment minus five. Um, I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez to share his thoughts or reflections. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I just want to applaud you, Nasser, for doing such an incredible job putting this case together, bringing the, the image. I think we all have um, learned so much in this hour. And so I just wanted to express my gratitude to you. And uh, thank you for such a phenomenal job. It's clear that uh, they chose you to be chief resident for a reason, my friend. Um, so let me give the mic to you, Nasser, for any final thoughts before you pass it over to uh, Deborah for the teaching points. Thank you, Ravi and uh, uh, Raza, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, um, um, I hope this case has, you know, helped the audience. Um, my teaching points for today is that when you deal with fever and rash, uh, just like what uh, Ravi mentioned, is that you want to rule out dermatologic emergencies such as Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic, toxic shock syndrome, or neck fash. And in patients who are immunocompromised or have a history of hematologic malignancies, EBV IgM can be negative. In that sense, you should not rely on it. Just send an EBV uh, viral PCR um, and uh, EBV reactivation uh, in, in the literature. Sometimes it can present similarly to dress syndrome. However, the timing of symptoms along with uh, the type of offending agent will help you differentiate between the two. So these are my teaching points for today. Thank you, everyone. Just superb, my friend. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Deborah, are you ready? Take us home with your teaching points, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the case. I want to say thank you for Shayma and Marcella, too, that give me a hand correcting my English while I was writing kind of quickly. And going for the teaching points, talking about the rash, we got to define if it's a horizontal vertical, how, how deep it is, if each and there if has how extension and that if has some organ involved. And then the physical exam will, will be extremely important because that can define uh, the questions. And in this case, the hash, the rash and antibiotic, antibiotics treatment and uh, the amoxicillin can make get worse and then um, can be associated with Steve Johnson uh, 10 and AGAP. And then the, the fever and rash, uh, like uh, we just learned, learned with the teaching points is definitely a emergency in dermatology that can think of what I just said, like Steven Johnson, Richard Derma and all that kind of, of things. And then can be too infection malignancy and autoimmune. And as this patient, it's immunosuppressed. We can always think about infection. And then uh, to finish, like we can describe if the rash is bleaching or not. If it's bleaching can be a vasodilation and not bleaching can be uh, red blown cells extravasation. So, and the, the diffuse uh, lymphadenopathy uh, make us think about autoimmune and malignancy. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. And let's, I see you guys tomorrow. Deborah, thank you so much. That was fantastic, my friend. Couldn't agree more. Marvelous job. All right, see you all tomorrow.